Okay, so um, the next the next topic is going to be um, again from a phylogenetic perspective is look at um, is to look at um, niche comparisons. We often, when we have multiple niches, we want to ask how similar they are. If we're looking at a uh, phylogeny, we've got many different closely related species, and we want to ask how similar are their niches. There are two approaches we might take for this. Okay? One is we could compare the underlying environmental preferences. So we could say, what's the temperature range for this species? What's the temperature range for this species? Okay? Or we could compare the projected niches themselves. So we can look at the maps and say, how similar is the area selected as being suitable for this map against this map? Okay. This is something that we often want to do when we're trying to look at multiple niches across the phylogeny. Okay, um, so in order to do this sort of thing, we need to um, extract the environmental variables. So yesterday we did this within QGIS where we plotted our points and we drilled down into the environmental layers to produce a matrix of data points so that for each sample we had the temperature and the precipitation and all of these. It's actually also a standard output from Open Modeler. So Yesterday, when we ran the open model models and we, and we had our reports, we can look at the table tab, and it, it gave us our sample IDs and all of the environmental values found at those locations. Okay, so that's two ways to get the same data. Oh, we can do it now. And once we have that, we can then sort of do um, plots. This could be a uh, box plot or something like this, where we've got a sort of average and then a, a range of observations for a whole bunch of species. And we can do a, a comparison to say, okay, is this, is this range of precipitation values different from this? And we can, yeah, if we've got a box plot or something, we can look at the confidence intervals and say, I've got a significant difference in terms of temperature preference, precipitation preference, so one variable at a time, okay? And that's a really simple analysis, it's essentially just taking our um, the, the previous matrix, working out the minimum and the maximum confidence intervals like we did yesterday within, a, um, within the GIS, and just using that to plot them on a, on a graphic. Okay, um, Another way we can do the comparison is rather than look at one variable at a time, we can try to look at the whole niche in one go. And one way to do that is to visualize that niche on our map by projecting onto the map. Okay? So here's a plot of a, I think this is a, a biofilm model, or it could be any niche model where we've just converted our map to presence absence projection. Okay? Here we've got a distribution for one species, here we've got a distribution for another. We can compare the similarities of the areas selected by these two maps. Okay? Um, so this sort of correlation, we could do something like a, 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 a Pearson correlation by just picking random points across, but there's specific methodology for um, niche comparisons. Okay, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is the D and the I mm -hmm. statistic. Um, it's um, uh, this, the Warren Warren et al. publication mm -hmm. that describes this. I've got the reference on another slide. Okay, um, you can form these D and I statistics using R, um, and there's um, other software tools that allow you to do this. I think. Um, uh, e and M tools, I think, does it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and essentially, these two statistics, um, mm -hmm. don't have to worry about the um, uh, values. So essentially, they're a 
there are <coughs> method, uh, there are a measure of correlation between two niches that score between zero and one. Uh, so the, the, the equivalent of a Pearson correlation coefficient, where zero means they're completely different and one means they're completely the same. Okay, the 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 D, the D um, value um, was compared was used to compare microhabitats. Um, it's not it's not the best fit for niches because it's it's presumed to be a measure of species density. Um, so perhaps given um, um, the work that um, Enrique Martinez Meyer was showing us uh, um, a few days ago. He was interpreting uh, his uh, the, the niche model output as species density output. So perhaps that suggests that this is more relevant. But tra traditionally, the I statistic is um, better thought of in terms of niche modeling comparisons. And again, it's a, it's a simple zero to one score that sh that, that, that shows the uh, similarity of niches. Okay, so. Here are three different niches, and essentially we can do a simple uh, calculations. Okay, what's the correlation between this and this? Okay, and we get us we get scoring somewhere between 0 and 1. So in this instance, Drosera peltata and Drosera gigantea have the highest correlation of 0.5 using the I statistic and 0.37 using the D statistic, whereas Gigantia versus oh, what's this? Binata has the lowest correlation because you've got the distribution over the southwest corner which is a southeast corner and this has a very low correlation. Okay. And it's very simple to um, perform this sort of correlation using R. So these are the, the, the commands that we're going to use to do this niche overlap. Okay, we just read in our um, map outputs from our um, modeling. Okay, one, two, three, and then we do this command called niche overlap, and that calculates this matrix. And it just you can just see the matrix to read off the numbers. Okay. Um, so niche correlations uh, are, can be quite useful to us because they can help reveal phylogenetic patterns. This is a phylogeny of sun use. Okay? And for each of these species we've developed a uh, we've developed our niche model. Okay? And then we've used a niche correlation against all of the other species. Okay? These are aligned by relationship, phylogeny relationship. And we can see we have these big blocks of this clade has a really high correlation. Dark means high correlation, light means low correlation. Okay? And we can see that for this play, we've got, you know, it's very sort of self-similar, but then for all of the other species in the same, uh, in, in, in the tree, we've got very low correlation values. So the niche correlation reveals a phylogenetic pattern for us. Okay? And it suggests that we've got, at least for this play, and maybe for this play, We've got strong similarity with niche similarity within clades, whereas between clades in these sorts of areas we've got low niche similarity. But towards the base we get a little bit, more, a little bit more messy, and this clade doesn't show a strong pattern. Okay, but when we use this sort of co uh, comparison, we need to be careful because, especially when it when, when it's based on the um, map projection. Depending on what resolution we're looking at, we might actually have the same thing that on a large scale maybe looks very similar. Okay? On, a, on a sort of Australian scale, two things that overlap slightly in um, Tasmania, that's a very similar niche. But then when you look on this scale, actually there's a very small overlap and there's lots of area that... And, uh, you know, that so depending on the scale that we're looking at, we can have something that may be very similar or very different. So just like when we're trying to do model evaluation, um, the, the background is important and the background can, 
can be the difference between something that looks similar and something that looks different. Okay. Obviously, if we're doing multiple across a phylogeny, we should use the same background for all of our comparisons, because then we have a consistent message, yeah? and we'll have relative correlations being consistent across the comparison. Okay? Even if the score values are not sort of directly interpretable. Okay, so once we have our um, once we have our niche correlations, okay, we tried we we we've, we've tried to sort of look at the phylogenetic pattern for these. If we have a dated tree, we can look at a correlation between our niche overlap, our niche correlation, and the age to the most recent common ancestor. And again, this is a second test of the phylogenetic conservancy of niches, where the more recent divergences are more, re are, are more closely related species. And if we have a niche conservancy, we would expect that overlap between those niches to be higher. As we move further away in time, so we have a, a larger age to the most recent common ancestor, those species are less closely related, we would expect a lower niche overlap between those species. Okay? So uh, 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 an, a nice analysis that we can do is basically a scatter plot that says for each pair of species in our phylogeny, we can plot on one axis the niche overlap and on another axis the age to the most recent common ancestor. Okay? And if we have a pattern of phylogenetic conservancy across the whole tree, we would expect a sort of correlation that moves in this direction. Okay? As we get older, as we get <coughs> more distantly related, um, we, we get a lower niche overlap. And we can perform this in R using the phylogen package using basically um, uh, uh, four simple commands. Okay, and we're going to try and repeat this example, although I think this is another slide, um, where we have our uh, a small sundew phylogeny, okay, where we have the niches built for each of our species. Okay, we have our dated phylogeny. Okay, we can work out the niche correlation between any pair, and we can work out the age to the most recent common ancestor between any pair. And then we can plot this on a scatter plot and do a uh, regression line to say what's the relationship between age and niche overlap. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to do now. <laughs>